Well, hello, my name's Kent Hovind. I live here in Pensacola, Florida. Uh, I was a high school science teacher 15 years, and now I've been in evangelism over 10 years, traveling and speaking on the subject of creation and evolution and dinosaurs. It's my great privilege to get to do debates uh, with various people who do not believe the Bible. I've debated against atheists and agnostics and skeptics and professors of various uh, fields of science. I defend the biblical uh, worldview as being scientifically accurate and historically correct. In this debate you're about to watch, I'm debating a former preacher turned atheist. Uh, Farrell Till has a paper called, I think, The Skeptical Inquirer or something like that, up in uh, Peoria area where I'm from. And he's uh, been very vocal in his uh, rejection of God's Word. And so we, I, we had a debate there in Pekin, Illinois, on the topic of, is the biblical flood uh, and all the historical, all the accounts of the Bible flood and Noah's Ark, is it scientifically accurate? And I'm sorry for the quality of the debate. It's a little bit poor quality. It wasn't a super duper camera and it wasn't uh, uh, the best we could do, but uh, we'll do better next time. But I hope you enjoy the message anyway, as uh, you'll see Farrell Till, a former Church of Christ, uh, calls himself a former Church of Christ preacher. I think he was just a, a missionary on the mission field um, you know, representing the Church of Christ for a while, but now he claims to be an atheist. And you'll see as we've debated. If you watch my video series, you'll see some of the questions that come up in this debate that do not get answered for lack of time are answered on my debates on my regular seminar series. And please feel free to call if you have any questions. We'll be glad to help. Uh, we'd be glad to uh, answer any questions you have. We defend the biblical view against all comers. If you read something on the internet or on the uh, World Wide Web that blasts me for some reason, well, at least give me a chance to defend myself. Give me a call. I'm normally in the office Thursdays and Fridays. My uh, phone number and address will come up on screen, and you can call or write. We'll be glad to answer your questions. Hope you enjoyed the debate now. Tonight, to this evening's debate between Mr. Farrell Till and Dr. Kent Colvin. We know that many of you have looked forward to this debate for some time. Uh, certainly these individuals are no stranger to our area as they have corresponded with each other and articles from each have appeared from time to time in local newspapers. I'd like to go over, if I could at this time, the format for the evening and then what I will do with you is I will introduce uh, the two men who will be debating this evening. Our first round will consist of opening statements from each they will be 30 minutes in length for each one. That will be followed by a five minute break. Afterward, there will be rebuttals uh, that will take 20 minutes from each. And then we will go into question and answer from uh, those of you in the crowd. And what we will do during the break is we will make available to you three by five cards that you can write your questions out on. They will be brought back to me and I will go through them and uh, take of those questions, uh, those to the uh, debaters. First of all, tonight we'd like to introduce uh, the gentlemen that are here with us, and we thank them for coming tonight. First of all, I'd like to introduce Mr. Farrell Till to my immediate left here. Mr. Till teaches English at Spoon River College in Canton, Illinois. He has served in the past for 12 years as a preacher and a missionary for the Church of Christ. He is the author of a quarterly journal entitled The Skeptical Review. He has extensively debated issues concerning biblical inerrancy. And from time to time, he has written columns for the Secular Humanist Bulletin. We welcome him here this evening. And then to my far left is Dr. Kent Hoban. He is a creation science evangelist. Dr. Holbin speaks roughly 700 times a year on the subject of creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. He's a native of the East Peoria area, and we welcome him as well this evening. We're going to begin tonight with the first round, and uh, we're going to begin with Dr. Kent Holbin, who is going to take 30 minutes for his opening remarks. Dr. Holbin. <coughs> Well, thank you so much. It's good to be here. I wish it was under different circumstances. Had to uh, have a funeral for my father today, uh, but he was ready and anxious to go. So that was more of a joyous time than anything. Uh, my name is Kent Hovind. I was a high school science teacher 15 years. I became a Christian 24 years ago, 20, almost 25 years ago, and I started going to church and began reading the Bible. And I tell folks without apology right up front, I believe the Bible is the infallible, inspired, inerrant word of the living God. I believe it from cover to cover, and it's not uh, just a blind belief. I believe it uh, because the more I study it, the more it verifies itself to me. And uh, 
I know there are, there are skeptics and scoffers, where well, the world has always had those, and uh, the subject we're going to limit it tonight, when uh, Mr. Till and I have been corresponding and calling each other about what this debate should focus on, we decided to center it on just the accuracy of the biblical account about the worldwide flood in Noah's day. There are a million other subjects could come up in this, but we're going to try to keep it just to that. So if you get my slide projector on there, brother. The Bible warned us in the book of 2 Peter, chapter 3, and verse number 3, that in the last days, scoffers are going to come. Let me turn this mic so I can see that also. 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse number 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts. The reason people scoff at the Bible is because of their lifestyle. They don't want there to be a God because God interferes with their lifestyle. Thomas Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, said that. He said, the reason we've chosen evolution is because of our sexual freedoms we get with this lifestyle. And that's the reason people choose the philosophy, and they scoff at the Bible because of their lusts. That's what it says. Now, let's keep reading here. And they're going to say, verse number four, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fall asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of. Willingly ignorant. Now, it's interesting. I have a letter. Uh, Mr. Till and I were corresponding, and he wrote a letter back to me July 29, 1993. I, I told him that the reason uh, skeptics uh, have to have a debate situation like this is because if they just had a meeting on atheism, they couldn't get a crowd together. Ten or fifteen people would show up. Here's his response. Now, I admit, uh, time came for the lecture. I had an audience. I will admit it wasn't, don't have as large a potential audience as you would have, but there are far more superstitious people in our society than rational thinkers. So that does give you an advantage, which I freely admit. So, in other words, typical scoffer, if you believe the Bible, you are ignorant, is basically what it amounts to. These scoffers, it says, though, are willingly ignorant of two important things. They're ignorant that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. The original creation, when God first made it, was very different than the creation we see today. The original creation was destroyed by a worldwide flood. The first thing people are ignorant of is the creation, what it was really like. That's why they try to interpret today's creation as if that means something for how the world used to be, and we'll show you in a minute that cannot be done that way. The second thing scoffers are ignorant of Verse number six, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. The world overflowed with water and it perished. There was a worldwide flood. So scoffers are ignorant of the creation and they're ignorant of the flood. The third thing they're really ignorant of is looking down here at verse number seven. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment. It's really the judgment people are avoiding. So let's talk about this original creation for a moment so you understand how the flood fits into this. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God made it about six or 7,000 years ago, and it's easy to demonstrate that scientifically. Let me skip through a few things here. This is not about the creation account necessarily. Tonight, the debate is about the flood, but this is essential material. Oh, there we go. Genesis 1, 6. God said, let there be a firmament. The word firmament, shown later, means an atmosphere, a place where the birds fly. It mentions that in verse number 20. Genesis 1.20, the fowl fly in the, open, in, the heaven, in the open firmament of heaven. So the firmament is a place where the birds fly. Back in Genesis 1.6, God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. Second Peter says scoffers are ignorant of how God made the heavens. The word heaven is plural in Second Peter chapter 3. There were three heavens. The first heaven is where the birds fly. Second heaven is where the sun, moon, and stars are. We call that outer space, mentioned in verse number 14 off the screen here. Second heaven, Genesis 1, 14. And the third heaven apparently is where God lives. Apostle Paul said he was called up to the third heaven in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So there are three heavens. There used to be a layer of water above this first layer, above the atmosphere. And that's not uncommon. And many of the planets in our solar system have a vapor barrier, have a, a canopy, a cloud cover. And so and the earth itself has six or seven different layers to the atmosphere. There used to be a layer of water. Psalm 148 talks about the waters that be ab above the heavens. When God first made this world, there was a canopy of protective water above the atmosphere. The purpose being to shield the earth from uh, outer space cosmic radiation and also to provide greater air pressure and to give the earth the greenhouse effect. So everything grew enormous in the pre-flood world. It filtered out the radiation. I'll skip through some things here from my normal presentation that I do at churches. 
Today, people are rarely over seven or eight feet tall. Robert Wadlow is almost nine feet tall, extremely rare. But pre-flood skeletons have been found of people, like this one found in a coal mine in Italy. This one is 11 feet, six inches tall. There were seven or eight 12-foot skeletons found in a coal mine in West Virginia. Now, the evolutionist wants you to think man started off small and we're getting bigger and better and stronger and smarter, and we are the gods of this universe. The Bible says we were made in God's image. Man may have been 10, 12, 14 feet tall before the flood. They were living 900 years. It was a different world in that pre-flood canopy, under the pre-flood canopy, people and animals grew to be huge. Go ahead and skip up there if you would through all this up to uh, whatever number's next. Not only were the people much bigger before the flood, the animals were much bigger. Fossils of nearly every kind of animal alive today have been found in, in fossil form that are huge. Rhinoceros, 18 feet tall, have been found. Now the evolutionist says, the scoffer says, well, this lived, this was during the Jurassic period. Uh, the, there's no such thing as a Jurassic period, but the, the, this was in the pre-flood era. Animals were huge. Dragonflies with 36-inch wingspan have been found. Grasshoppers, two feet long. Cockroaches, 18 inches long, have been found fossilized. Cattails, 60 feet tall. I'll scan through this quickly. Beavers, eight feet long, have been found. Giants of all sorts have been found. Giant sharks, giant turtles, giant birds, 13 feet tall. Skeletons of enormous proportions compared to today's standards have been found. The Bible-believing creationist, like myself, says this was in the pre-flood era from the creation until the flood. For 1,600 years, it was a different world. Things grew huge. Everything was giant. Even the lizards grew to be huge. The lizards were the dinosaurs because lizards never stopped growing. Lizards in the pre-flood Garden of Eden conditions would grow to be enormous. And we have lizards of all types today that are miniature dinosaurs. And most of my research in cryptozoology has been on even some of the bigger dinosaurs, 25, 30 feet long, that are still alive like Loch Ness Monster, Lake Champlain Monster, Mokley Membi, Ogopogo, and Lake Okanagan, and I can go on for hours just on that subject. There are some dinosaurs still alive. Go ahead and skip up to the next one there if you would, brother. I'm not saying there's millions of them, but there's a few, and the whole scenario of evolution is insane. After the flood, though, Genesis chapter 9 tells us two things changed. Man and animals were allowed to eat meat after the flood. In the pre-flood world, they didn't eat any meat. And today everything is suffering. The whole creation is suffering and, and pain and travail. And God's going to fix it back like it used to be. Let me skip up to just a few here. Then we get into Noah's Ark. People say, no, wait a minute. Was the Ark big enough to hold all the animals? I believe even dinosaurs were on the Ark. I've got a model here. This is a 1 600th scale of Noah's Ark. I got engaged animals from a uh, local hobby shop. They are too large for the ark scale. The ark should be six feet long in order for these animals to be the right scale. Inside here I have uh, 21 different interesting observations about Noah's ark that you may want to read before you decide the story is not true. Some interesting things. For instance, if Noah was 10 or 12 feet tall, like he may very well have been, he lived to be 950 according to the scriptural account, then the ark built by his cubit would have been much bigger. A cubit is from your elbow to your fingertip. I'm only 6'1", and my cubit is 21 inches. The standard cubit they use to measure things is 18 inches. Even with an 18-inch cubit, a small ark, there was plenty of room because Noah only had to bring, he could have brought the babies, bring young ones. That would be the obvious conclusion. I figured that out. I'm only 40. Noah was 600. I'm sure he figured out bring babies. Just be sure to get a pink one and a blue one. And they would be smaller. They would live longer after the flood's over, and that's why you're bringing them to begin with. So bringing young on the ark would conserve an awful lot of space. Plus, you only had to bring two of each kind, not two of each species. I taught biology for years. I'm very familiar with the classification system. But the skeptics will always say, well, you know, there's X number of species in the world, and they couldn't all fit on the ark. Well, not just a minute. True, there are 250 varieties of dogs. But Noah only had to have two of the dog kind on the ark. The Bible says he brought two of each kind. That would include the foxes, the wolves, the coyotes, the hyenas, and the dogs, all in two animals. In the last 4,400 years since the flood, there has been a lot of variation within the created kind. Ask anybody that raises anything, uh, any animals, a cattle breeder, horse breeder, pig breeder, corn raiser, anything, they will tell you there are, there's an awful lot of variation available, but it's always within limits. You can get bigger and bigger pigs, but you're never going to get a pig as big as this building. There are limits. And anybody that raises animals will tell you there are limits. And there has been a lot of variation since the flood, but that's not evolution. It's still the same basic kind of animal. The wolves and the hyenas and the dogs and the coyotes and the foxes are the same family. Now, our classification system of kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species wasn't made until the last couple of hundred years. 
And that is not at all what God was using. God said, no, what? Two of each kind, not two of each species. So don't fall for that argument that he had to bring two of every individual species. There's been speciation. There's been a lot of interesting research about Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat, right at the corner of Turkey and Russia and Iran and Iraq is Mount Ararat. There are two competing schools of thought on this. One group thinks, oh, excuse me, one group thinks the Ark is actually on Mount Ararat, and it may be. There's another group, who I know Ron Wyatt right here, had lunch with him one time, uh, talked to him several times. Another group that thinks Noah's Ark may be this object right here, this boat-shaped object. The Turkish government thinks it is. They think the Ark has collapsed in on itself and folded out. The structure there that I just showed you is 515 feet long, which is exactly 300 Egypt, Royal Egyptian cubits. If that's the Ark, I don't know. The Tur here's it is right here. The Turkish government has built a visitor center. And they started construction on a highway, but the political uh, situation over there is very unstable. So they've kind of slowed things down. There is a full-time fellow there who lives there as, to keep people from stealing pieces of if they think that's Noah's Ark. Anchor stones have been found. Okay, go ahead and uh, skip up there, if you would, brother, to the next one. The credibility of the Ark actually being there, there's a big CBS special on that, uh, and a lot of people say it is. Then, of course, Time and Discover Magazine both wrote a retraction saying, oh, CBS didn't know what they were talking about. They should never have run that. See, the scoffers, uh, skeptics, can't stand competition on a level playing field. They want to have a majority of the market and don't let anybody even see the other evidence for the other side. If it happens to support the other side, hey, we can't let them see that. That's why creation is not taught in our public schools, because the scoffers know it, it would overwhelm evolution. Evolution is a silly, crazy idea that doesn't, hold any, doesn't have any common sense to believe that, and so they don't want competition for their belief. They talk about the geologic column. Uh, let me back up just a little here. These scoffers talk about this geologic column, these different layers of strata. And I taught earth science and biology for many years. The geologic column doesn't exist any place in the world. The best explanation of the fossils that are found, like this human shoe print with a trilobite embedded in the toe and heel, and the evolutionist says trilobite lived 600 million years ago. There's a human shoe print where a man stepped on two of them. Polystrata fossils prove those layers are not different ages. All of those layers that you see in the fictitious geologic column were deposited rapidly during the one year long flood. The world was completely overwhelmed for one year, and polystrata fossils are found frequently around the world. Trees petrified standing straight up, running through all the layers. But the geologic column, the Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, Archaeozoic eras, and the different periods, you know, the uh, Silurian, Devonian, Mississippi, and all that stuff, the only place you can find that geologic column is in the textbook. It doesn't exist any place in the world, and that is the Bible to the evolutionist. The geologic column is the Bible to the evolutionists. They interpret everything in light of the geologic strata that it's found in. That's how they date the fossils. Which strata was it found in? Here's a from workers at a wall in France digging a highway, and tree trunks found petrified standing straight up running through all the layers of strata. Petrified fossils are very common. In the vertical position, polystrata fossils running through more than one layer. The idea of the Earth being billions of years old is crazy. It cannot be billions of years old. But it was the geologic column that influenced Charles Darwin to doubt the scripture. And Darwin became ultimately an atheist because of his teaching in the geologic column. Is that up to the next number there, brother? I can't see what number is around there. Skip up to... Uh, I go to the end of this one? No. <clears throat> yeah, I think so. Okay. So the ev evidence for evolution and great age for the earth is, uh, they say, well, each of these layers are different ages by millions of years cannot be true. I can demonstrate that quickly. Mount St. Helens did a classic case uh, of evidence for that. Mount St. Helens blew 900 feet of sediment down into the valley. I'll show you pictures in just a second. And it was all stratified. The worldwide flood caused all of the layers of strata. Noah was in the ark for a year. They talk about Pangaea, continents fitting together as proof for evolution. The textbooks treat this subject as if it is a fact, and it certainly is not. They'll say 200 million years ago, Pangaea probably began to break apart. Well, it's no question that it's 200 million years in their mind, but the fact that they fit together doesn't prove they ever were together. That's pure coincidence based on the water level. This building is perfectly parallel to the house across the street. That proves they broke apart 40 million years ago and Cook Street oozed up in between them. <laughs> proves no such thing. Let me give you a creationist interpretation of what happened. Starting with this subject of what happened to the giant woolly mammoths. The mammoths up in Siberia are found frozen, frequently standing up. Nearly every kind of animal has been found frozen up in Siberia. They found bobcat, jaguar, lynx, camels 15 feet tall, rhinoceros, elephants, woolly mammoth, no people yet, but boatloads of, of fossils that are frozen can be found in the Siberian regions. 
The problem with the skeptics is they don't understand the original creation. There was a canopy of water that protected the earth. It was like a terrarium. It was designed for man to live here forever had he not sinned. As it was after the sin, they only lived 900 plus years. So the original creation was different. That's where all the giant animals come in. And the world was loaded with trees. And so all the coal formations and natural gas formations and uh, oil, form oil deposits and all that were laid out because of the worldwide flood. The flood lasted one year. Here's what one, inter one creationist, myself and many others believe this. This is one school of thought for what may have happened to cause the worldwide flood. The mammoths are found frozen in a standing position. Let me skip through a few things here. Oh. From some of the temples around the world, like Stonehenge, Edexus, Amun-Ra, it has been determined that the Earth has wobbled throughout its history. The North Pole has not always been where it is. The Earth today is tilted over 23 and a half degrees. I believe this happened because of the flood. One theory is that the Earth was struck by an ice meteor, and many me ice meteors are floating around in space, just giant snowballs. If an ice meteor came close to the Earth, or through our solar system, some of the fragments may have been pulled off, and that might explain why Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune all have ice rings around them. They may have been spun into centrifugal orbit because of the uh, ice meteor coming through. That may explain the craters on the Moon. Lots of craters and even flow formations on the Moon where water was flowing, and on Mars, but yet no water. It may have been hit by an ice meteor and then subsequently vaporized. It's just a theory, but because ice at low temperatures, three to 400 below zero, is magnetic, the ice, as it came closer to the Earth, it may have blown apart, and the stronger magnetic field the Earth used to have would suck the ice particles to the North and South Pole. And the 300 and 400 below zero ice would freeze the mammoths rapidly, food still in their teeth, still in their stomach, undigested. The magnetic North Pole seems to be the center of the ice age, not the geographic North Pole. So the magnetic North Pole seems to have had something to do with the so-called Ice Age. The South Pole has 14,000 feet of ice, and yet it never snows at the South Pole. It's considered a desert. So either it took millions of years to accumulate 14,000 feet of ice, or it was all dumped there rapidly. While the volcanoes are going off and the ash is being mixed in, you would get thousands of layers of ice and ash and a mixture of all sorts of things at the South Pole rapidly. The mammoths, as it began to snow, were buried, died, suffocated, found with their food in their stomach, still green today. The meat is still edible today. I stayed at a man's house in Canada a couple of months ago. His dad was up on the north slope of Alaska. They ate mammoth meat. Been buried 4,400 years since the flood would be the creationist interpretation. As the ice went, <coughs> excuse me, as the ice went racing out across the, uh, from the poles, from this ice dump, it would carve out the glacier effects that we see, the huge scratches across the Canadian Shield and the Matterhorn and the obvious glacial effects across the northern and southern parts around the world. The world then, covered with two giant ice spots, would have two cold waves that would come off and cause that canopy of protective water to collapse. And it rained 40 days and 40 nights, like the Bible says. The water came from this ice barrier. Also, the Bible says the fountains of the deep were broken up. Now, everybody knows within the crust of the earth there is enormous volume of water. Volcanoes frequently shoot out steam and water, millions and millions of gallons. I don't know how much was there in the pre-flood conditions, it may have been more, but if the fountains of the deep broke up, like geysers shooting out, maybe the rips along the Earth's crust, like San Andreas Fault or Hayward Fault or Mid-Atlantic Ridge, maybe those are the rips where the water came gushing out. Don't know, I wasn't there. But that hot water striking normal ocean water would kill all the fish in that area. You would have thermal shock, explaining why fossils are found, like the diatoms, are found in huge thick layers. In Lompoc, California, the diatomaceous Earth is 1,500 feet thick. And yet diatoms are microscopic animals that takes a thousand years to get one inch of accumulation at the bottom of the ocean at today's rate. But with a thermal shock situation with hot water out of the Earth's crust hitting the oceans, they would die by the zillions and fall to the bottom. To prove the diatomaceous earth was formed rapidly, a baleen whale skeleton was found in a diatomaceous earth quarry by Grefco Corporation in Lompoc, California. The whale was 80 feet long. It was standing on its tail in solid diatomaceous earth. Well, now, if it takes an inch, if it takes a thousand years to get an inch of diatoms, did the whale stand there and balance for millions of years on his tail while the diatoms slowly formed around him? I find that very difficult to believe. It had to be a catastrophe, a disaster, trapped that whale. Same thing with the chalk cliffs of Dover. Chalk is microscopic organisms that live in the ocean, and they are 300 feet thick over there, solid chalk. It had to be some type of thermal shock to do that. Noah, in his ark on top of the water, for one year, the Bible says the flood lasted just over 12 months, Noah was floating safely in the ark as thousands and thousands of feet of sediment were being deposited under the ark, under the water. Just the earth turning under the moon with the tidal pull of the moon with no continents to stop it. 
the tidal pool would constantly reshuffle and reseparate the sediments under there. You can get a jar of dirt out of your yard, put some water in it, and shake it up and set it down. In 10 minutes, you'll see layers begin to form. Gravels go to the bottom, then sands, then clays, then topsoils. A perfect soil profile. Do it any place. Go get a jar of dirt and add the water. That's what happened during the year-long flood. All of the layers of strata that we see were formed rapidly. Some of the animals were buried and became fossils. Other animals floated around for a while and bloated and rotted. As they rotted, their carcasses fell apart. And so when they finally were buried, as the waters went down, if they were buried, they might be buried in tangled up heaps, fossil graveyards, which are found all over the world. And usually the bones, like this dinosaur backbone here, are found with no legs, no head, no tail, no rib cage, and no teeth marks. This animal was not scavenged, it rotted and fell apart. This dinosaur backbone is bent backwards, twisted, contorted positions. Fossil graveyards, tangled up messes of bone, sometimes three or four miles deep, solid bones, are all over this world. Fossil graveyards every place. I think obvious interp the obvious interpretation is a catastrophe of global proportions that caused that. People say, well, where did all the water go after this flood? Where did the water go? The Bible says in Genesis chapter 8, more about the flood. After the flood, God remembered Noah and all the cattle, and God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged. The word assuaged means to sink down. The water did not soak into the ground, and it did not dry back up into the atmosphere. The atmosphere couldn't hold that much water. And I'm sure Mr. Taylor will bring that out. It couldn't rain that much, and you know, there's not enough water in the oceans to cover the earth. Well, there's enough water in the oceans right now to cover the earth 12,000 feet deep. If the earth were smoothed out, if the mountains were pushed down, and the valleys, the oceans weren't as deep, if the earth were smooth, the water would be 12,000 feet, over two miles deep, over the entire surface of the globe. There is plenty of water in that ocean to flood the world. Psalms chapter 104 talks more about the flood. The Bible says, God laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever. Thou coverest it with the deep. That's the ocean, the flood. God covered the earth with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. There have always been skeptics who say, well, it was a local flood. Look, you don't get a local flood with the water going over the mountains. Plus, if it's a local flood, why did God tell Noah to build a boat? Why didn't he say, Noah, move? There's going to be a flood. It was a worldwide flood. At the voice of thy... At, I'm sorry, at thy rebuke, they fled. They referring to the water. The water fled. At the voice of thy thunder, they hasted away. The water raced away. You say, where's it going to go? If the world's covered with water, water seeks its own level, where's it going to go? Keep reading, verse number 8. They go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys unto the place which thou hast founded for them. Thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over, that they turn not again to cover the earth. This phrase, they go up by the mountains, is an old English phrase. Today's language would more likely say it like this. The mountains ascend, the valleys descend. Many reference Bibles uh, say that. The mountains ascend, the valleys descend. What I believe happened after the flood, the crust of the earth, being very thin and flexible, the crust of the earth sank in the skinnier spots. The thinner places on the earth's crust sank down. The crust of the earth is thinner than the skin of an apple compared to the apple as far as proportion. Very thin. I taught her science for years. Under the continents, the crust is about 25 miles thick. Under all of the ocean basins, the crust is 3 to 5 miles thick. Much thinner. I believe that's the thin spots that sank down, the mountains lifted up, and the water raced off into the holes, carving features like Grand Canyon and Badlands in a matter of hours, because you had enormous volumes of water moving through soft sediment. The rock layers were formed, the sediment layers were deposited during the year-long flood as the mountains lifted up and the valleys sank down, the more cracks appeared in the earth, and it might be a coincidence, but all of the mountain ranges in the world follow the coastlines. Just look at your globe. Mountain ranges follow the coastlines. Oceans sank down, the mountains lifted up. Some of the mountains lifted up slower, leaving behind smooth, rounded mountains like the Appalachians. Some lifted up faster, leaving behind rugged mountains like the Rockies. The earth cracked up into plates, either because of the impact of the meteor or because the fountains of the deep broke up right there, or later on, a year later, when the mountains arose. There are three possibilities of when the cracks and mountain ranges appeared. Rock strata that are found bent like this all over the world are a very common feature. You don't bend rock layers like that, twisted, contorted rock layers. They had to be bent while they were soft mud. As the mountains arose and the valley sank down, those layers were formed. The water ran off, forming features like that. The entire top of Mount Everest, the top 3,000 feet of that mountain, is covered with sedimentary rock packed full of remains of animals that once lived in the sea. Seashells 
clams in the closed position are found on top of Mount Everest, tallest mountain in the world. Mount Everest wasn't there before the flood. Mount Everest rose up after the flood. The Himalayan range didn't exist until after the flood. The earth didn't have any giant mountain ranges and it didn't have any deep ocean basins. So the argument will come up, well, hey, is, you know, could the world, is there enough water, to, could it rain enough to cover Mount Everest? No, you're thinking of the wrong world. Scoffers are ignorant of what the original creation was like and they're ignorant of the flood. The mountains rose after the flood and the valleys sank down. The water raced off into those holes. Is there another? Yeah, switch, switch to the next one there real quick, brother. I got about, how much, four minutes left? Okay, I'll try to get through this Mount St. Helens real quickly and give you an example of what might happen. So the, the people will say that the idea of the worldwide flood is impossible. I haven't really studied the evidence. There are sedimentary rock all over the world, and petrified clams in the closed position are very common. And I'll have to skip some of this, but the center part of the oceans, the abyss, is the deep part. The other part is called the continental shelf, where it's not as deep. About half of the ocean here, at least at the Arctic Ocean, is the abyss. The other half is continental shelf. The oceans were smaller after the flood, I believe, for a while, because uh, the textbooks all say here, millions of years it took the Colorado River to carve the Grand Canyon from solid rock. Well, they're basing that on a couple of faulty assumptions. They're basing on the assumption that the Colorado River didn't start on it until after the rock was solid rock. If it was all soft mud, and those are obviously mud layers turned to solid rock, then the erosion would be very rapid. Mount St. Helens did that. When it blew in 1980, the top of the mountain began to blow, and then the north slope slid down. And the volcano made a mudslide, scalding hot mud and ash slid down for many miles. Matter of fact, this computer image, the mud slid all the way down and blocked off the Toodle River. Here's a picture of the mud dam blocking off the Toodle River. Five days later, the water backed up over the top and went over the top of the dam. Here you have lots of water behind a soft mud dam, and erosion was very rapid. It carved a canyon 140 feet deep, 1,000 feet wide, 2,000 feet long, and it carved it out in 15 minutes. When the scientists went down into the canyon after it, water got back to stabilize, they noticed the canyon sides of it were all stratified, all nice, neat layers. That's because as the mud flowed in, hydrologic sorting automatically separates the particles by density. Heavier stuff went to the bottom, and you can go there today, and some geologists will say, oh, this bottom layer is 800 million years old, and it was all formed in 1980, <laughs> rapidly. <laughs> Textbooks always say the Grand Canyon is kind of puzzling because it loops like a sl slow gradient. Mississippi loops and meanders around because it's low gradient, but it also has steep sides like a fast-moving high gradient stream. They say it's kind of puzzling. How did this canyon form? Well, see, they're thinking of it all wrong. The Colorado River did not make Grand Canyon. The flood made Grand Canyon. The Colorado River just happens to flow through the crack, that's all. The logs that were floated in Spirit Lake, here's Mount St. Helens in the background, the logs th floated, three square miles of logs floated there. Many of them got waterlogged and began to float in the upright position and then sank to the bottom. Remember I showed you the polystrata trees running through all the different layers of strata? That formed during the flood. All those layers deposited rapidly. Mount St. Helens is doing the very same thing for us today. Scuba divers go under there and say there are 20,000 logs in the bottom of Spirit Lake right now, stuck in the mud. All over the world, you can find tree trunks petrified in the standing position. Yellowstone has hundreds of them. If they fall over, they will break. And you go through any petrified forest and you'll see the tree probably petrified standing up and then fell over a couple of hundred years later. I think my time is up. After the flood, the waters assuaged and the waters returned from off the earth. The water, as the mountains rose and the valley sank down, the water would tend to race back and forth for a while. It says that in Genesis chapter 3. And the secondary erosion would take place as the layers were wiped off and new layers deposited on top from the waters going back and forth. It wasn't safe for Noah to get out of the ark for a short time. And all of these features of this millions of years ago stuff is ought to be illegal in our textbooks. It has nothing to do with science and you cannot prove those layers are millions of years old. That whole geologic column is the Bible to the evolutionist, and it's a fraud, it's a hoax, it does not exist any place. That book, the Bible explanation, the worldwide flood, is the best, most reasonable explanation of all the features we see on this world today. Thank you so much. to both of our uh, speakers and please be mindful that uh, they are holding the floor and uh, that uh, we need to give them uh, the utmost in respect and the allowance uh, of the full use of their time. So at this time we'll hear from Mr. Till.
Dr. Hoven, <coughs> Mr. Helen, and ladies and gentlemen. I want to begin by expressing my appreciation for the opportunity to be here. I think it's very commendable that this congregation is willing to invite me here because it has to know that I'm going to say some things that are directly opposed to what this church stands for. And I wanted to express my appreciation before anything else was said. I also extend my uh, sympathy to Dr. Hoven on the death of his father, which many of you perhaps knew even before he mentioned it. As one who experienced the same loss in his life, I know what he must be feeling. And uh, I appreciate his uh, keeping the commitment to be here, even though that tragedy happened in his life. Be that as it may, I hope the audience will understand that this is a public debate and that we are both very firmly committed to what we believe. And I hope none of you will think that if I press the issue that I am in any way uh, attacking him personally because that is not my intention. One thing that I regretted was that uh, he did not read and define the proposition and after listening to his speech, I think I know why. I think he wanted to discuss his creation science theory more than he wanted to debate the proposition that we agreed to debate. That proposition reads like this. The Genesis story of the worldwide flood is scientifically accurate in all of its details. The word scientifically is a key word that needs definition. Obviously this word comes from the uh, uh, noun science and science is an investigation, examination of scientific phenomena. Scientific phenomena are those things that occur naturally according to the interaction of the laws of nature. And if you would read the uh, very first verse with which the story of Noah's flood begins, you'll see that he has a big problem on his hands. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to Genesis 6.13 and let's notice what it says. And God said to Noah, and God said to Noah, when you have God speaking to men, and when you have men speaking to gods, you have left the realm of the natural and you have entered the realm of the unnatural or the supernatural. So we see that the uh, story of Noah's flood began with the fact that cannot be considered scientific because it has nothing at all to do with the laws of nature. And uh, he also referred to the place in the Genesis story where it says that God sent a wind to dry the surface of the earth. If God sent a wind, then this was not a natural phenomenon and therefore it cannot be a scientific detail. I want you to understand that his commitment is to prove that all of the details in the Genesis story of the flood were scientifically accurate. And I saw a little effort on his part to say the Genesis story of the flood says this, and here's why it can be considered scientific. And the Genesis story of the flood has to say this, and it can be considered scientific because of this and this and this. That was what I expected him to try to do. I'm going to show you in just a minute how that it's absolutely impossible for this event to have occurred as it is recorded in the Bible and that we can absolutely know that it was impossible for this event to have occurred as the Bible records it. But first I want to make some comments on the remarks that he made. He said the reason why people reject the Bible is that they want to live a loose life. Well, I sort of consider that to be insulting and I'm not even going to bother to comment on that, but it's not the first time that people have said that to me. And I'm perfectly willing to compare my morality to his or anyone else who claims to be a Christian any time that people want to do that. 
He read from uh, Genesis 1 and he told us that there was a canopy of water above the earth back then. What was his evidence? What was his scientific proof that such a canopy of water existed at that time? I didn't hear him present any such proof that such a thing as that existed. He showed us uh, some slides to indicate that animals were huge in the past, and I'm not going to deny that that is so. I know uh, that animals tended to be large in the past. After all, we have the age of the dinosaurs. But that is a far cry from proving that people lived to be 900 years old as the book of Genesis tells us that they did, but be that as it may, none of this has anything at all to do with uh, the Genesis flood as it is recorded in the Bible, and that is the thing that he is supposed to be proving. I was very happy to see him refer to uh, petrified trees that have been found standing in place, and I was a little bit surprised that he referred to... Uh, uh, Yellowstone Park as an example of a place where you can go to find these. I just wish that he had tried to go more into detail on what is found at a place called Specimen Ridge in Yellowstone Park. At Specimen Ridge there are 27 petrified forests standing on top of each other with a layer of volcanic ash in between. And these are not trees that floated in the water during the great flood for a period of time and then sank to the bottom standing upright. Because geologists have discovered that many of these trees are in place with their root system petrified in the layer of rocks that they are sitting in. And 27 forests with a layer of ash one on top of the other, are to be found in this place. Many of the trees have been examined, and the rings indicate that the oldest were 500 years old in each layer. We'll multiply 27 by 500, and you get more time than his creationist theory will allow. And also it's a known fact that it takes about 200 years for uh, a volcanic deposit to decay so that it's suitable for plants to take root in. So you uh, multiply that into your formula and you see you have about 20,000 years and that's just about two times too long for his creationist theory. Anyway, in the time that I have, I want to develop a point, and I want you to listen very carefully to this. He showed you a model of the ark, and I'm going to prove to you that it is impossible that any such boat as that was ever made. God said to Noah, that is unscientific. But what did God say to Noah? Well, he told him to build an ark and he told him to make it and I'm going to translate everything into feet. He told him to make it 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet tall. Could a man living back at that time have built such a boat as this? To put this in its proper perspective, I'm going to ask you to imagine this in a modern setting. Let's say that you're a member of a family of eight because there were eight members in Noah's family. And let's just assume that God appeared to you one day and he said, I'm going to destroy the world by a flood and I want you to build a boat out of gopher wood, whatever kind of wood that was, and I want you to make it 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet, feet high you would have a tremendous advantage over Noah. You'd be able to go to Walmart, you'd be able to go to Kmart, you'd be able to go to Ace Hardware or such places as this and buy the most sophisticated tools that have ever existed. Power saws, band saws, planers, uh, crowbars, steel hammers, and so on. You'd be able to go to the lumber yard and you'd be able to buy pre-cut lumber 
You wouldn't have to hack your beams out of the uh, uh, standing tree that we, I assume that Noah had to do if he built such a boat as this. Do you think that you could do it? How would you undertake to do this? First of all, the notion that a man could do this 5,000 years ago fails to take into consideration that you just don't go out one day and decide that you're going to build a wooden boat 450 feet long. There is a science to shipbuilding. You have to have a knowledge of physics, you have to have a knowledge of calculus, you have to have a knowledge of architecture, you have to know something about structural analysis. How did Noah understand what kind of sheer forces would be at work in this huge gigantic flood that he has just described to us? And in a flood that would do all of the things that he presented in this uh, scenario in his slide presentation, the Hurricane Andrew would look like just an afternoon thunderstorm in comparison. This boat was going to have to take forces that probably no ship has ever taken before. I doubt if anyone in here who has any sailing experience would find this story very believable. My wife and I, in returning from the mission field, aboard a ship got, a, got caught in a hurricane, and I can tell you that that is not a pleasant experience. And when I think back on that, I can think about gir uh, a giraffe being in the ark, being slammed against the wall because we had to be strapped into our bunks to ride out the storm because if we tried to get up, he would be slammed against the wall. So how did Noah know how to do this? Well, the fact is, friends, he couldn't have done it because it can't even be done today. And I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm going to say. And I hope that Dr. Hovine will address this issue when he comes back for his second speech. I'm going to say it again. A wooden boat 450 feet long that's seaworthy cannot be made. The longest wooden ship that was ever made at the height of the shipbuilding industry in the last two centuries was 377 feet long. The name of that ship was the Roshan boat. And after it was built, the builders found that when it was put into the water and they tried to sail it, that it moved with an undulating or a snaky motion that caused warping of the hull and serious leaking. They tried to correct the problem by putting straps of steel diagonally along the sides, but still, they were never able to use that ship in deep, in deep water, they had to settle for short coastal hauls. The United States government from 1900 to 1909 built six six masters. They were called six masters because they were equipped with six masts. The longest of these was the USS Wyoming that was 322 feet long. Noah's Ark, presumably, was over a hundred feet longer than that. They had the same problem. Even though they tried to reinforce with the diagonal strips, they found that the undulating movement through the water caused so much warping and stress to the hull that bilge pumps had to operate continually. Now this was at the height of the shipbuilding industry. It was precisely because of this factor that the shipbuilding industry turned to steel and abandoned wood because they discovered that about 300 feet is a maximum length 
for a wood ship, and when you pass that limit, you experience the problems that I have just described to you. I hope you have paper and pencil with you because I'm going to give you some references to check. You won't be able to check them uh, tonight, but those of you uh, who know Dr. Hovind, I hope you will contact him and ask him to give an explanation for this. You won't find these in your library, I'm sure, but most libraries now have a system that we call interlibrary loan. And if uh, you ask the library through this system to get the books for you, they should be able to do it. Go and ask for a history of technology that was published by Oxford University Press Request volume five, turn to page 355, and in an article entitled Shipbuilding by A.M. Robb, you will see this 300 foot limit factor discussed and verified. Also request the, build, the British shipbuilding industry from 1870 to 1914 published by Harvard University Press, pages 13 and 14 in that book, you will see verification of this 300-foot factor for wooden ships that I'm talking about. And you can also request American Ships, written by Alexander Lang, L-A-I-N-G, he will discuss this factor, or he does discuss this factor on pages 403 to 409. And in that section, he quotes John J. Rockwell, who was the designer of the six masters that I talked about a moment ago, including the USS Wyoming. And Rockwell said, quote, six masters were not practical they were too long for wood construction. Now you've seen uh, Dr. Hovind pull a, uh, uh, a stunt that is very familiar to me. I've had a lot of debates and my opponents have done this repeatedly. They do it in just about every debate. They try to dazzle the audience with a lot of charts, with a lot of slides and that they don't take the time to explain. And they want to leave the impression that they are just overwhelming the opposition with their evidence. But the book of Genesis said, and God said to Noah, you make an ark that's 450 feet long. I want him to explain to us how Noah was able to accomplish that scientifically since the best shipbuilders that the world have ever known were not able to go beyond 300 feet and make a seaworthy vessel. You know, uh, creationists like to talk about their expeditions to uh, Mount Ararat. In the first place, I wonder why they're going to Mount Ararat because the Bible doesn't say that the ark came to rest on Mount Ararat, it says it came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And Ararat was a nation at that time that is now occupied by uh, the, what is known as Armenia. They might be looking in the wrong place for their boat. Maybe he'll want to talk about that. I don't know. But you know, I have a suggestion for them, of course, they're free to approach their uh, subject the way that they want to. But I think uh, their time would be spent more practically if they would just go to Walmart, Kmart, and get all those tools that I talked about. Go to the lumber yard and get their pre-cut lumber and build a boat to those specifications and put it in the ocean off uh, the coast of Florida and wait for a hurricane like Andrew to pick up a lot of steam and then just sail that sucker right into it, loaded down with giraffes and elephants, and then have a look at the cargo after it rides out. Something like that. 
if the thing is even afloat after then. How in the world are they going to make a boat like that? Since there was uh, uh, not anyone able to do that at the height of the shipbuilding industry. This is a factor that he has to explain to you. Well, let's pass on from that to something else that I would like for him to explain. Of course, he gave you the creationist line about, uh, well, Noah didn't take aboard representatives of every species. He took kinds. He took kinds. He took a canine kind, and from that, that pair of canines, a male and a female, we now have dogs and jackals and wolves and foxes and uh, many other specific varieties or species. And he took one deer kind, and from that we now have, uh, we have a moose, and we have a caribou, and we have a white-tailed deer. We have all of the 37 different species that have developed over a period of just 5,000 years from that one kind that was taken aboard the ark. There are over 100 specific species of bovids. In, in bovids you'll find cattle, goats, sheep, and so on, so you'll know what I'm talking about. Well, he wants us to believe that Noah just took seven pairs of them. Because most of the bovids are clean, I'm sure that he will agree with that. And that all of these 100 species have developed in a period of just 5,000 years. My friends, he ridicules the evolutionists, but there isn't an evolutionist in the world who would stand before you and say that change that dramatic could take place in such a short period of time. They just will not do it. And yet he wants us to believe that Noah just took a few animals aboard the ark and everything that we see in the world today, all of the hundreds of thousands of species developed. Let him explain to us how that happened. Have eight minutes, right? Also, let's take a creationist figure Henry Morris, a name that I'm sure that he's familiar with, has figured it out. Noah had a population of only 50,000 animals aboard the ark. Well, 50,000 would be a lot. He had to have an elephant kind, I assume, and he had to have a giraffe kind, I assume. By the way, when you come up here, Dr. Holbein, please explain to us how those giraffes and how those elephants were secured aboard the ark in all of the stress of that violent turmoil that you described without being dashed to pieces so that they were bloody pumps after the storm was over. He told you correctly that according to the Genesis story that they were aboard the ark for a little more than a year, a year and ten days I believe to be exact or thereabouts. Can you imagine the stench that would have developed from 50,000 animals in a space like that? Now there's no way for me to say this without just being indiscreet, but did you know that an elephant will produce 40 tons of manure in a year's time? Did you know that a sheep will produce 700 pounds of manure in a year's time. Well, no problem. They just scooped it overboard. Oh, sure they did. Where did they find the time to do that while they were trying to take care of all of the animals and make sure that they were fed in water? There, there are serious problems with this story, and he simply is not willing to admit it. And by the way, did you know 
that many of the animals had to have specialized diets. I'd like for him to explain how that problem was taken care of. The koala, which is native to Australia, of course he probably believed that uh, it lived somewhere else back at that time. But the koala native to Australia will eat only eucalyptus leaves. And zoologists have discovered that some of them are so adapted to the eucalyptus grove that they were born in and grew up in that if you remove them from that grove to another eucalyptus grove, their digestive tract just cannot adapt to the change. Did, Mo did Noah take along, I almost said Moses, did Noah take along a eucalyptus tree to feed the koala? Giant pandas can eat only bamboo shoots. Did uh, Noah have a greenhouse on the ark that grew bamboo shoots for the pandas? If so, where did it get the light? Because there was only a one cubic window in the ark. And let's get back. I forgot to say this, but it's very important. David Balsiger, who was the uh, producer of the uh, movie about Noah's Ark that he mentioned, he is a creationist and he says that there were only 800 tons of manure produced during uh, the year's voyage. Of course, he didn't bother to explain how he arrived at that figure, but 800 tons, that's a lot of you-know-what. And have you ever stopped to think of the problem that, that would cause for the crew? The disease that, uh, that it would cause? Do you know also that methane is a primary byproduct of manure? Did you know that methane is highly explosive? Have you ever stopped to think that the first time that Noah or, uh, or a member of his family lighted a lamp down in the lower decks to feed those animals after that much manure had accumulated and methane gas from it that it would have blown the ark to smithereens? Yeah. Time up? No. Okay. Those are problems that are serious problems. And he needs to give you explanations that can be accepted on a scientific basis. And in the two minutes that I have remaining, I want to talk to those of you in the audience who are sitting there thinking, oh, that's no problem to me. It's no problem to me that shipbuilders were not able to build a ship that was seaworthy, that is a wooden ship, beyond 300 feet, because God could do it. That's right. But how scientific is that? God could have waved a, ma waved a magic wand and made it so that the animals aboard the ship would have produced no manure to contaminate. How scientific is that? You see, that's the thing that he's got to explain to us. I'm going to read it to you again. Over the telephone, we agreed to this proposition. And I sent it to him through the mail. I put my signature to it. The Genesis story of the worldwide flood is scientifically accurate in all of its details. So he's got to come before you now after the intermission. And he's going to have to explain to you how that ship could have built, been built beyond the 300 foot limit without God performing some miracle because he's arguing that it was scientific and you people who are saying amen you've got to understand what he is trying to do he wants to put creation science into the classroom but to do that
But to do that, you've got to make it science. You can't explain everything on the basis of, well, God could take care of it because that is not science. And that's the problem for him. And that's the problem for you who say amen when, they, when it's said that God could take care of everything. Thank you. Uh, this flood account could not be scientific because it starts off with God speaking to man and man speaking to God. We left the natural world and his connotation is if it's not observable, testable, demonstrable, scientific, um, it's not provable. I would like to see somebody who's ever seen an atom or an electron or a proton or a neutron. Nobody's ever seen one. I mean, there are many, we, no, show me some gravity. Give me a jar of it and paint it red. You know, what is gravity? What is magnetism? What is light? There are many things that we cannot see that we use constantly. And I would contend that God is just as real, though he's above and outside and beyond all of those forces. He's the creator of those forces. There's a watch. There has to be a watchmaker. There's a creation. There has to be a creator. That's obvious. His contention that because we today cannot build an ark, therefore it could not be built is pretty wild in my opinion. We today could not build the pyramid. 70 ton stones up near the top of that pyramid, 480 feet off the ground. Nobody in the world today knows anything. No, nobody can figure out how they built that. Therefore, by his logic, it, it isn't there. <clears throat> yeah, it, I believe it is. Uh, just because we today don't know how they built it doesn't prove it doesn't exist. I think the pyramid's a classic example of that. As far as uh, he, he mentioned, I'm just trying to take, answer his questions that he brought up here so he doesn't uh, accuse me of not answering the questions. Um, he then he, I, I, I should have, I didn't get time to get the whole quote down. Something about it was insulting uh, to his belief. I would like to remind you of the insults in his letters, accusing anybody who doesn't believe, anybody who does believe the Bible of being ignorant, or uh, I could get the exact quote out of his letter here, but he is also very insulting, and I don't mean to insult him. I want to be sweet and kind. My motive is to strengthen your faith in the Word of God and to win him to the Lord. That's what I would like to do. He's not the enemy. He just works for him. Um, <laughs> Then, he mentioned Specimen Ridge. Specimen Ridge has, does have 27 forests, and his, his logic was classic here. He said the root system was intact. I don't know where he got his uh, research there. I just finished reading an, an enormous book just about Specimen Ridge and about the 27 fossil uh, tree layers found there, tree, tree, tree levels found there. The worldwide flood could indeed have done that. It is interesting that none of the trees are more than 500 years old. A worldwide flood would have deposited trees in many layers, loaded with ash and volcanoes going off at the same time. And the trees have a root, a root system out just a few feet, and then all of the roots are broken off. None of those trees have an intact root system. They were all yanked out by the roots, just like Mount St. Helens did. Exactly. Go scuba diving under the log mat at Mount St. Helens. You'll see the exact same thing today. It's proving it all over again. And then he says, because there are 27 layers and the, t the trees are 500 years old, simple mathematics, you can multiply those two together. Ah, ah, you're assuming now that all those trees are different, come from different forests. Many of those trees, and I can show you the picture again if you'd like, one tree will be running six or eight or ten feet tall. The next tree starts three feet higher than the one right next to it. And yet the tree is ten feet tall. So they're all running through the same layers of strata. All of those trees, I would contend, were deposited in a one-year-long flood. All 27 layers were deposited rapidly. So to multiply 27 by 500 and to say that proves the Bible isn't correct is very faulty logic. And then you assume, of course, that the people 4,400 years ago in the pre-flood world were ignoramuses. I would say we today, by their standards, would be the ignoramuses. Adam walked with God, for one thing. Adam lived 930 years. The accumulated knowledge that could be passed down from generation to generation. Noah's daddy, Lamech, could have known Adam. Adam was still alive when Lamech was here, according to the dates given in Scripture. So there was an enormous amount of accumulated knowledge, and the people at 900 years of age would learn an awesome amount. Plus, in the pre-flood environment described by the Bible, where they lived longer and the animals grew bigger, increased oxygen, during, especially during fetal development, causes much higher IQs, and the people probably had IQs of three or 400. I can't prove that scientifically, but they did some enormous things, some incredible things back then. And all sorts of fossils have been found. I talked to a man two weeks ago who worked in a coal mine. They were, he was, he was in, working in front of the shovel as they were scooping out the coal, and they found a cable, a braided rope cable, similar to what we use today, but it was stainless steel, found embedded in the coal, 200 and some feet long. Gold bells have been found in the coal. Gold chain, six feet long, found in anthracite coal in Wyoming. All of these things documented. Man and animals, uh, and all these animals that died in the flood were very advanced. The, man, the men were, and had all sorts of things. The Bible says the pre-flood world, the people were artificers of brass and iron. 
They had iron before the flood. His contention is Noah couldn't use any iron. Ron Wyatt, the pictures I showed you of Noah's Ark, if Ron Wyatt has it, is not on Mount Ararat. It's in the mountains of Ararat, like he mentioned. It's 12 miles from the actual mountain, Mount Ararat. The little valley it's in is called the Valley of Eight. And there's a little village there called the Village of Eight, and nobody knows why the village is named that or the valley is named that. But it might be because that's where the eight people got off the ark. Ron Wyatt found rivets, iron rivets, about the size of my thumb and about this long. I held them in my hand, badly rusted, some of them not too badly rusted, iron rivets. Noah may have bolted that ark together. If the pre-flood trees were growing huge, like everything else was growing huge in the first 1,600 years, Noah had giant logs to work with. And it took him 120 years to build the boat. And God gave him the instructions of how to build it. And it wasn't designed to go any place. It didn't have to sail like a 300-foot-long ship has to sail someplace. It just had to float. It was a barge. Where was there to go, for one thing? I mean, the world's covered with water. So Noah only had to float. It could easily be done. And the contention that because we can't do it today, I would go back to the pyramid analogy, that's faulty logic. As far as the science of shipbuilding, Noah's Ark, according to the scriptural dimensions, was a ratio of 6 to 1, which is the perfect ratio to withstand storms. Six to one ships, and that's the way most of the ships are built, to approximately that length to width ratio, because they automatically face into the waves and they can't get capsized that way. Many tests have been done on models of Noah's Ark, and they indicate that Ark could have stood waves of 200 feet. That's what the analysis shows in the, in the tanks that they test these uh, ships in. And then, of course, he assumes that no, I love the way he always gave the extreme examples of, well, what about all these giraffes and elephants? Was the ark full of giraffes and elephants? I mean, the average size of an animal today is smaller than a sheep if you average all the animals. Why pick the extreme of a giraffe and an elephant? And again, I go back to say, well, Noah could have brought babies, could have brought young ones. That would be the obvious thing. I would do that. I'm only 40. I'm sure Noah figured that out. And God brought the animals to Noah. Noah didn't have to go get them. That's what the Bible says. God brought the animals to Noah. And then he used the extreme, to get that boat full of elephants and giraffes and sail into Hurricane Andrew. Well, of course, you're assuming that the whole year-long flood was hurricane conditions. We don't know that. The Bible doesn't say that. It rained 40 days and 40 nights. It doesn't, you don't always have a hurricane when it rains, you realize that. And it may not have been any hurricanes. It may have been a bad storm, lasted 40 days, the water came up, the water coming out from underneath. Noah might have been hundreds of miles from the cracks, the San Andreas Fault, the Hayward Fault, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. He may have been in very tranquil seas for the whole year. We, the Bible doesn't say so for me to have to prove that a boat could withstand a hurricane is totally off the subject. I don't have to prove that. He would have to prove that Noah wasn't in tranquil seas. He can't prove that either. It's outside the realm of science. Science has to be observable, testable, and demonstrable. I can demonstrate that a 6 to 1 ratio ship is the perfect ratio to withstand violent weather. That has been demonstrated over and over in, in shipbuilding courses and things like that. Approximately 6 to 1 ratio. I cannot prove that today we could build a 450-foot-long boat that would float, but I cannot prove today how they built the pyramid either. I have no idea how they built it. And then he said that I didn't offer any scientific proof. Um, I think I did. I think uh, I showed that if by only bringing two of each kind and not two of each individual species, they could easily fit on the ark. That limits the number way down. Um, let's mention that. Noah's boat only had to float. Let's see. 300 foot max, that's of course by today's standards. If you have pre-flood environment with the people much smarter and the people much stronger, and Noah with a hundred and some years to do it, he could easily have built that boat. I have no doubt believing that. And he certainly did not prove scientifically it could not be done. He assumed, of course, no iron or steel. And as I mentioned, uh, Ron Wyatt and others have found iron rivets. So it may have been bolted together or it could have been pegged together. There are over 250 different flood accounts from cultures all over the world. There must be a reason for that. Why do 250 different cultures around the world talk about a flood, a worldwide flood in most of them, where a family, or sometimes they say brother and sister, but a family were saved in a boat of some kind? Many of the stories are twisted and perverted, and they don't all match exactly, but they all indicate they must have all come from a common source, like maybe the real worldwide flood. Uh, let's see if I covered everything here. The Bible says the ark was made of gopher wood. The Hebrew phrase there, gopher wood, means laminated wood. I held in my hand a piece that Ron Wyatt brought back from the ark site in uh, the Valley of Eight. It was about two and a half feet long, about four inches thick, and it was three layers of wood cross-grained to each other. Plywood, similar, like the, like the uh, beams in this ceiling. Laminated wood. 
And if that is indeed what gopher wood means, and Noah built it out of laminated wood, I held it in my hand, petrified, very heavy. And the layers were stuck together with tar, and they had been pressed together, where the three layers were bonded to each other, just like we make plywood today. And I'd say a 600-year-old fellow with a higher IQ than we have today would figure out a way to do that, uh, no problem. Then, let's see if I cover all this. He talked about uh, me pulling a theatrical stunt, or I, I forget his exact words there, by using slides and charts to dazzle the audience and to overwhelm you with evidence. And yet his whole presentation was offering evidence with lack of slides and, and visuals that you can't build a boat over 300 feet long. Very, doing exactly what he's accusing me of doing. I'm trying to educate. I'm trying to show it could be done. It's very scientifically possible. And the example of using all the extremes. Then he mentioned about the different species, a hundred different varieties or species of uh, the bovine family, the cows and sheep. I don't know how they were divided before the flood, but you can ask any cattle breeder. You can get a variety in just 20 or 30 years. Dogs, you could, start with a, you could start with 50 dogs from the dog pound, get 50 generic mutts, and in less than 200 years, you could develop all 250 varieties that we have today on the earth. You could go from the Great Dane to the St. Bernard to the Chihuahua. That, that can be done. It's incredible the variation available within the genetic structure. With natural breeding processes, usually it, the species tends to remain more stable. But if there's geographic separation, isolation, because of living on different continents, then the species depend, tend to vary even more. And eventually they might get to the place where they cannot interbreed. Alaska rabbits cannot interbreed with Florida rabbits. But Alaska rabbits can interbreed with rabbits from Minnesota. And Minnesota rabbits can interbreed with Florida rabbits. So the Florida rabbit and the Alaska rabbit have diversified where they're no longer interfertile because their breeding cycle is different. But they're still a rabbit. That's, it's, nothing has changed. It's the same kind of animal. It's a different variety now of rabbit. And some have, can stand the cold weather. Some can, some can stand the hot weather. But that could easily happen in 4,400 years. That can be done in 20 years in the laboratory with no problem. Oh, uh, let's see. He wants me to believe, he wanted you to believe, that it's impossible for these animals to vary in 5,000 years from the kinds on the ark to the varieties we have today. And yet he believes tomatoes changed into people the philosophy of evolution. You talk about variation. I don't care how much time you give them. Give them zillions of years. You're never going to get a tomato to change into a person, in, no matter how gradually. They talk about, well, it's a miracle. You know, if a, if a frog turns into a prince instantly, that's got to be a miracle. That's a fairy tale. You know, you kiss the frog and it turns to a prince. I agree. That would be a miracle. And yet evolution teaches the frog did change to the prince, but it took 300 million years. It is still a miracle. If a man races across the air, we say, well, it's a miracle. Well, if he walks slowly through the air, is it less of a miracle? <laughs> Time is... that's silly. I mean, oh, no, that didn't happen fast. That would be a miracle. But it happens slowly. Evolution is still just a pagan religion, and it relies on miracles. They cannot explain where the original matter came from. They can't explain where the laws came from. They can't explain where life came from. And yet they want to teach that in the science classes and have our kids learn that. And they're upset about creation getting into the classroom? They better look in the mirror and see what's in those textbooks now. We're teaching all kinds of pagan things that cannot be proven. We're teaching the frog turned into the prince. I taught biology. You should see the charts. There's the frog at the bottom and the prince at the top. It's the same fairy tale, and that has never been demonstrated. So if their argument is we shouldn't have creation in the classroom because it is not scientific, I'll say, I agree. Let's get evolution out for the very same reasons. Evolution is not scientific either. And unless they're going to teach both, they should teach neither one. I say, well, a majority of scientists believe in evolution. The majority of people believed it was, the world was flat at one time, too. I didn't flatten it out. And you can't use majority opinion as an argument at all. The assumptions, though, uh, that he brought up here, assuming, of course, that man is ignorant and we are advanced, is a faulty assumption. I think man was advanced and we are ignorant. <coughs> Prove that's wrong. As far as special diets, um, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 21, God said, And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. If you refer back to Genesis 1.29, God told Adam and Eve and the animals, Genesis 1.29 and 30, all the animals and all the people were vegetarian before the flood. Nobody ate meat. He didn't have to keep the lions away from the lambs on the ark. They were all vegetarian, and people can live fine on vegetables and fruits today. Even grizzly bears can get by on nuts and berries, though Yogi doesn't like to. They would like to have meat. 
And panda bears can eat a wide variety of food. Panda bears can eat meat. They're usually too lazy to go get it, but if you feed a panda bear meat, he'll eat it. Ask a zookeeper if panda bears are restricted to a particular kind of bamboo. I think you'll find that was an over-exaggeration. They can eat a variety. Plus, we don't know that the animals we have today and their specialized diets, they may have adapted to that special diet. That would be adaptation from the last 40, 400 years. They live in a particular forest all their life and generations, and pretty soon they get to where they cannot handle other foods. That's not proof that, no, that they all ate that 40, 400 years ago. They may have eaten a wider variety back then, and we may have variation within the created kind, where now it is more specialized. That could happen. A friend of mine up in Minnesota has two aquariums. He has a saltwater aquarium and a freshwater aquarium. Huge, huge aquariums. Over a 10-year span, he slowly decreased the salt in the saltwater aquarium and slowly increased and added salt to the freshwater aquarium. Within 10 years, he got both types of fish to live just fine in half salt water. And then he put all the fish together in the same aquarium. In 4,400 years, the animals could diversify into the kinds we have today with no problem, and you cannot prove it didn't happen that way. I can't prove it did. By strict definition, science has to be observable, testable, demonstrable. I can't prove that it did. I wasn't there, and neither was he, and neither were you. So it's outside the realm of science. We're going to have to take the written word of God's account, and unless we can find it provable, prove that it's scientifically inaccurate, Aristotle's dictum says, if you give the benefit of the doubt to the text, unless you can find proof that it's wrong, and we haven't seen any proof that it's wrong. He's also assuming that all the animals were large. As I mentioned, you would bring small ones. He is assuming, of course, that these animals are awake for the whole time. Many animals during storm situations go to sleep or hibernate. I'm not saying they all would, but many animals do. They simply will sleep through the whole thing. And during hibernation, if you study your science, during hibernation, animals recycle their body wastes. A bear will go to sleep for the winter and will actually recycle the urine and feces into his system for the whole time. How amazing how that happens, how the acids and everything are broken down. Do some homework on that, you'll find out I'm exactly right. So we don't know that they produced all these thousands of tons of manure. And the boys, of course, and Noah's family with eight of them on board, that would be one of their jobs, is to keep the ark clean if it was necessary. I'm not gonna call on the miraculous. I'm saying, hey, during storm situation, you forgot about hibernation. As far as methane gas being produced, again, I would go back and say, no, wait a minute. He did not prove that, that's, that the animals weren't hibernating, and he cannot, and I cannot prove they were. It's outside the realm. We cannot test or demonstrate that. But assuming, of course, the larger animals, which he did, and assuming, of course, they all remained awake the whole time, and assuming, of course, they produced these thousands of tons of manure, there would be a methane problem. But the window, the Bible says the ark had a window 18 cubits, and the phrasing there is just like the people who've been into the ark say it's built, is like this. It said a cubit of 18 inches, that, that you will finish the ark in a cubit. Those who've been in the ark, and many have been in the last couple hundred years, say it has an 18 inch window all the way along, both sides. A huge raised ridge with an 18 inch window providing very adequate ventilation for the ark. There would not be a methane problem build up with it exploding. How much time left? Two, Two minutes. Um, is there anything I've not given a rebuttal for? I believe I got it all. I would have to say, without apology, like I said at the beginning, I believe this Bible is infallible, inspired, and inerrant. He has not given any proof that the biblical account of the flood did not happen scientifically. If the burden of proof is on me to prove it scientific, I'd have to say, oh, wait a minute, how can I prove that? It wasn't there. Um, nobody's going to prove that scientifically. If, pardon me? That's my job? Well, I, yeah, the, I guess I didn't catch that if this is a trick question in the, uh, uh, the way he designed the, the question for me to have to prove something, you know, prove, uh, prove animals changed from uh, amoebas into people, you know, prove evolution. We'll debate that sometime. It can't, it can't be done. But the biblical account stands as written. 250 different accounts are given of it around the, around the world, and folks say, hey, this book uh, is correct. Millions of folks believe it. And of course, those that scoff at it think everybody that believes it is an ignoramus. And I think that's an insult uh, to my intelligence, certainly. I have a PhD in education and speak frequently on this subject, and lots of very intelligent people believe that book and would give their life for it. Thank you so much.
my goodness, I hardly know where to begin. He said that I want to talk about giraffes and elephants instead of the smaller animals. Well, the giraffes and elephants are here. And do you know, Dr. Hovind, that if uh, the giraffe is here, and it is the only species of its kind, check that out, and I think you'll see that that's so, it is the only species of its kind, so if it's here now, then evidently it was aboard the ark if his ark story is true. And I'll tell you something else, Dr. Hovind. There weren't just two giraffes aboard the ark, there were 14 of them. Because the giraffe will qualify for the classification of a clean animal according to the specifications that are given in Leviticus, the 11th chapter. It chews the cud, and it parts the hoof. And so therefore, it was a clean animal. There would have been 14 of them aboard the ark. And I still say that given, given this scenario that you presented about all of the turmoil that produced the Grand Canyon almost instantaneously and all of that, that there would have had to have been some pretty rough sailing for that boat. And I can imagine those poor 14 giraffes slamming against the wall. And I can imagine what they would have looked like after all of that was over, if the story is really true. I would suggest to Dr. Hovind that uh, he go to a library and that he get a book that discusses the subject of animal transportation. and see all of the care, the meticulous care that must go in to the caging and the confining of animals when they're being transported by water. I think he would have us believe that Noah just threw the door open to the ark and God had put an instinct into the animals so that they came aboard uh, without being herded into it. And he doesn't discuss such things as body slings. If a giraffe is transported across the sea, today it is confined in a leather body sling, even if it's smooth sailing. Anyone who has ever been to sea will tell you that that is absolutely necessary. He said that uh, Specimen Ridge has a tree that's so tall and then just a little bit above that is another one and a little bit above that one is another one. Well, yes, but he neglected to tell you that there is a layer of volcanic ash between the 27 distinct forests. And the only sensible way to believe that that could have happened would be for the forest to grow, the volcano to erupt, the ash to settle around the bases of the trees. And if any of you have ever seen a tree that uh, maybe during construction has dirt piled up around the trunk, that tree is going to die. And that is apparently what happened to these trees. And as the tops of them rotted and fell, it's entirely possible, if you want to talk about possible scenarios, that one left the stump six feet tall and the one next to it left a stump that was just three feet tall. But then the volcano erupted again, covered that with ash, another forest took root, and according to my uh, uh, source, Dr. Holbein, I regret that I don't have it with me, but I'm going to send it to you. According to my research, the roots of those trees are embedded in solid rock. That is, many of them. So that excludes the scenario that you presented. He tells us that compared to back then, we are the ignoramuses. What's his evidence for that? What is his proof? He has given you assumption after assumption. He has said there was a canopy of water above the earth. Well, what is his proof that such a canopy of water existed? Do you know that water weighs eight pounds per gallon? Did you know that? Pick up a gallon of water sometime. 
What kept that canopy in the air? Well, God did it. God did it. That is the simple answer that you ameners want to give to everything. But it is not at all scientific. There isn't an element of science involved in it anywhere. If you want to say that your God could have done this, then someone who believes in another God could say that his God could have done same things so that his creation story has to be considered true. But there's no science in any of it. He talked about uh, the ridge that was discovered in the mountains of Ararat where he thinks the ark is buried beneath it. Why doesn't somebody just go there and dig it up and show it to us? Have you ever noticed what I'm going to call the rotten luck syndrome for these people who man all the expedition to go to Mount Ararat? and look at the wood that they find there and the, the ark that they claim that they have seen there and they take pictures of it. And on the way down, the guy carrying the camera falls off a cliff or something and kills himself. Or the expedition is raided by bandits and they steal all of their supplies and wool and behold, when they get back to civilization, they don't have the pictures. It's always something like that happening. That seemed uh, rather uh, uh, unkind of God to do that because if he'd let them get back with the pictures, maybe prove to us that something like that is there, then maybe there wouldn't be people like me standing before you tonight denying that it's there. But he suggested that the ark is in this ridge somewhere in the mountains of Ararat. <coughs> But then, then he said that he has seen samples of wood from the ark. And I assume that he's talking about the uh, samples that guys like Joseph and the Barak claim that he has brought back from Mount Ararat. So where is this ark? Is it on Mount Ararat? Or is it in that other place buried under that ridge that he talked about? Noah built the boat in a hundred years, he told us. <laughs> Well, how did he arrive at that? He's just pulling the figure out of thin air. Where's the science involved in this? And didn't I tell you something? Didn't I tell you that he would not be able to deal with the 300-foot barrier to building wooden ships? If you think that he dealt with it, then you must be able to see something that I can't see. Because he said... The people were just smarter back then than we are now. And so they could do great things that we can't do today. Where is his evidence of that? Where is his proof of that? It's entirely speculation. And I'm going to read his proposition to you again. This is what he agreed to affirm. The Genesis story of the worldwide flood is scientifically accurate in all of its details. And what did he do? He stood before you and admitted that he couldn't prove it scientifically. I want you to check the tape because unless my ears played tricks on me, that's exactly what he said in his second speech. That he cannot prove scientifically that it happened. Well, that if he can't prove that it happened scientifically, then why in the world did he agree? To affirm this proposition. He talked about the six to one ratio. Bible inerrantists like to talk about the six to one ratio of the ark. But what they do not tell you my friends is something that you need to know. By the time the Genesis story was written, shipbuilding had developed to the extent that people understood that that six to one ratio was ideal for the dimensions of a ship. He would have you believe that Moses wrote the book of Genesis. There isn't a reputable scholar in the world who will say that Moses wrote that book. It was written hundreds of years after 
the time that you believe that it was written. Stop living in fantasy land, my friends. Go to your public libraries and request the, the, the books in which you can do research to find out some of these things for yourself. He said that the ark could have withstood 100 foot waves. Now how does he know that? Because the Bible tells us nothing at all about the internal structure that went into the ark. It tells us nothing about the keel, the spine of the ship, how big it was. It tells us nothing about the keelson beam that goes above the keel of a wooden ship to reinforce the hull framing. It tells us nothing about the dimensions of the hull frame. It tells us nothing about the support beams in the bow and how big that they were. So how does he know that that thing that he is showing to you, if it were at sea, in full dimensions could withstand a hundred foot wave? I can't prove that it did happen, he said. So we're just going to have to trust the Bible. If I stood before you as an Islamic mullah and I said to you relative to something in the Koran, now I can't prove to you that this happened this way. I can't prove it's scientific. We're just going to have to go with the Koran. How many of you would say amen to that? Or if I stood before you as a representative of the Hindu religion and I said, I can't prove to you that all of this that is written in the Vedas happened in a scientific way or that it happened at all. So we're just going to have to go with the Vedas. How many of you would say amen to that? Let's bring it to more recent times. Let's just suppose that I'm a representative of the Mormon religion. And I say to you, I can't prove to you that this and this and this that's written in the Book of Mormon actually happened. We're just going to have to go with the Book of Mormon. People, what kind of proof is that? What kind of logic leads people to say amen to a statement like that? There is no scientific investigation at all uh, involved in forming an opinion like that. Why well, you can get uh, variety in 20 years. Any farmer can tell you that, he said. Okay. Dr. Hovind, I want you to take a cow and begin with that. We'll let you have a bull, too. And by the way, you know, I wonder what farmer going into the uh, dairy business or the uh, beef breeding business would buy seven cows and seven bulls? Why not 13 cows and one bull? Why not 13 sheep and one ram? Why take along seven males and seven females of the clean animals? I don't know, maybe God wanted these animals to be monogamous. But no animal breeder would be stupid enough to make that kind of investment if he wanted to begin a cattle breeding industry. But anyway, getting back to what I started to say, Dr. Holbein, I'm going to suggest that you take a cow and a bull, and 20 years you come up with a sheep. Or you take a ewe and you take a ram, and in 20 years you come up with a cow. Those of you who are saying amen to all of these things that he's presenting to you, you need to understand exactly what he's saying. One bovine kind, or, or that is it would be 14 bovine kind were taken aboard the ark. And from that we get goats, we get sheep, we get bison, we get buffalo, we get all of the bovines today. And all that happened within 5,000 years. Someone came up to me 
uh, during the break and asked me a question that relates to this, and so I'm going to introduce it here. If Noah's family were the only humans who survived the flood, then how do we explain the racial variety that exists on the earth today? Are we to believe that that happened within the space of just 5,000 years? That the black races in Africa developed? The Asian races developed? The Caucasian races developed? The brown races uh, of uh, North and South America, that all of these developed within the space of 5,000 years. If he's not careful, he's going to talk himself out of the job because he tours the country speaking about creation science. And I say again, there isn't an evolutionist on the face of the earth who would stand before you and say, that diversity like that could happen that rapidly. Well, he wanted to know if uh, humans today could build a pyramid. He doesn't seem to think that we could do it. Well, I have a lot more confidence in uh, modern man than he does. Pyramids aren't being built today because we don't see any need for them. There was probably a religious purpose behind them at that time. Has anyone tried to build a pyramid? And uh, after all, Dr. Hovind, the largest pyramids in the world were not built in Egypt. They were built in Central America. And scientists will tell you, and I know that what scientists will tell you doesn't necessarily mean anything uh, to most of you, but scientists will tell you that most of the settlers in this country came to this country after the flood, and it would have had to have happened that way, wouldn't it, Dr. Hovind? Wouldn't it have to have happened that way? And yet they built the largest pyramids that the world has ever known. And I'm just sure that if a reputable construction company set itself to the task and actually wanted to do it, that it could build a pyramid. That in no way explains the 300 foot limit to seaworthy wooden vessels. That's a specter that's hanging over him. And uh, it's a specter that will hang over him the rest of his career if he continues to go about preaching this stuff. And do you know how he handled it? He said exactly what I expected that he would say. Well, God could enable this to be done. And I see or heard a few amens then, but I must tell you again, that is not scientific. He accused me of making assumptions, but I just wrote down a list of assumptions that he's given to us during his speeches. There was an assumption that a canopy of water was above the earth. There's no scientific proof at all for that. There is an assumption on his part that the earth was level and the mountains rose after the flood. Where is his evidence? Where is his proof for that? He has said that people were smarter back then than they are today. Looked like we would find some archaeological evidence for that. Noah lived 350 years after the flood, and creationists like to refer to this as reason why civilization was able to develop so rapidly after the flood. And yet the primary contribution that Noah made to the world, building the most amazing boat that was ever built, vanished completely. And according to archaeological studies, civilizations after the flood sailed in dinghies compared to what the ark was. And I see that my time is up, and I want to thank you for the attention that you've given me. Thank you.
very much, Mr. Till. I've had a difficult job up here. I don't know how much of the last uh, second round I have heard, but I have been sorting through these questions, and I want to say tonight I have done my best to be as objective and fair as I can here. Uh, they are good questions. I wish we had time to get to each and every one of them, but we simply do not. Here is the format for the third round of question and answer. Uh, we will direct a question to one of our gentlemen up here tonight and give them three minutes exactly to respond. And once again, please hold uh, any statements, uh, any outbursts, so to speak, so that they can get through because it is a short time. And then the other individual will have one minute of rebuttal. And then we will reverse the order, three minutes to the other gentleman and one minute of rebuttal to the other. We'll begin tonight with uh, Dr. Holvin, since uh, Mr. Till uh, just gave his 20 minute rebuttal. Here's the first question this evening. And it's interesting, I had this one picked out as uh, Mr. Till just uh, brought it up. Dr. Hovind, how did the various races of people, Negro, Oriental, Native American, scientifically be brought out of one family if the flood destroyed all? Okay, good question. That, of course, is assuming the genetic uh, isolation that we have today. A group of white people could not probably produce a black person today, given any amount of time. But if you, we don't know the genetic makeup that Noah and his family had, they have been may have been uh, combination of all of these races. What was the original race? What color was Noah? You'd have to assume he's white or black or one of the others, but if he had the genetic combination of all the races, there's an incredible amount of variation available in the genes. Ask, ask any family with eight or ten kids if any of the kids are identical. They'll all be different. Uh, all the 600 people in this room tonight are, are very different. Uh, so diversity is the way of life. And I think you would have to uh, assume in order to, to think that it could not happen, you'd have to assume that Noah was either white or black, and that's where the faulty assumption lies. There's no problem. After the flood, shortly after the flood, the people, uh, the Tower of Babel incident took place where God confounded the languages. I personally believe, though the Bible isn't clear, I believe that is probably where the races came into play because the small groups of people speaking their own language went off to their own areas, and anytime you get a small group of people inbreeding back within their own kind, they develop unusual traits, like the Indians' high cheekbones or the blonde hair, blue eyed of the Norwegians. That's a, that's a common feature of any small group in breeding. I mean, ask any cattle breeder that. You know, you, you isolate uh, what the feature you want. If you want more beef or more milk, you just isolate those out. And I think uh, the, probably it was the Tower of Babel incident within the first 150 years after the flood that caused the races to come about by purely natural processes. The evolutionist says they live near the equator and they got dark skin. Well, that's Lamarckism, you know. Acquired characteristics are never passed on to the next generation. That's been disproven 150 years ago. I mean, if I get a great suntan, that has no effect on how my children are born. Uh, so the evolutionist would have the same problem, the same barrier, you know. He couldn't prove it either. Uh, I would say I would have to stand, though I wouldn't claim to be able to prove it, that the races probably began as a result of the Tower of Babel incident. I, I didn't get to finish my slide presentation, but after the flood, the oceans were smaller which connected all the land masses. And if you look at a map of the world with no water in it, you'll see all the land masses just with the continental shelves are easily connected. The people could have walked any place, and then as those giant ice caps melted back, the water level would have been raised slowly. And by the days of Peleg, 100 years after the flood, the Bible says in the days of Peleg, the earth was divided. So the continents weren't really separated until 100 years after the flood. During that time, the people had already had their languages uh, divided at the Tower of Babel and they spread out to these different continents, and then the small groups of people inbreeding within themselves, peculiar traits became pronounced. Or maybe there were religious significances. You know, sometimes anybody who's an oddball born in a tribe is, is sacrificed, killed, you know. Somebody may want a peculiar trait and develop that in their, own, in their own family. Hitler tried to kill everybody that wasn't German. I mean, we see that today, so I, I don't know. I couldn't prove that, but that's, that's a, a plausible explanation. Okay? Thank you very much, Dr. Bowman. Uh, well, he may think it's plausible, but I see no plausibility at all to it. I'll repeat again, there isn't an evolutionist on earth who would think that diversity like that could happen in such a short time, even if isolation like this took place. You know, you'll criticize punctuated equilibrium, and you'll scoff at it. 
but uh, the theory of punctu punctuated equal equilibrium says that these changes took place over perhaps 100,000 to 200,000 years. But uh, I, I want to show you a flaw in his theory about the Tower of, about the Tower of Babel. In the 10th chapter of Genesis, the family, of, the family of Shem is taken up, Ham, Japheth, and it tells us that they became the father of this nation and this people and that people. And it says after each uh, section, these are the sons of Ham after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, in their nations. That's all through the 10th chapter telling us that they spoke different languages. And then we go into the 11th chapter and it says, and the whole earth was of one language. And then it tells the Tower of Babel story. You people say there are no contradictions in the Bible. You need to read it, and dust it off, see what it really says. Bill. Mr. Till, the question has been asked, why must creationists explain God said to Noah, but evolutionists are not required to explain missing links for which no scientific evidence exists? Well, that doesn't really relate to the flood, but I'll be glad to give my answer to that. There are no missing links. What were the Australopithecines? Have you people ever heard of the Australopithecines? Fossils that have been found. They're not human, but they're not apes either. They're somewhere in between. Let's wait till they finish laughing. And I wonder how many of those who are laughing have bothered to go to the library and check into this. If you do, you'll find pictures of anthropologists sitting in their studies with skulls all over the place and anyone can look at them and see that obviously these skulls are not from the same species, but uh, they obviously are human-like in their appearance. And the fossils indicate that Australopithecines walked upright, but they had a small brain cavity. And it wasn't until, I believe, Homo erectus developed that the brain took on a size that enabled uh, the hominids to, uh, uh, to make stone tools and use them to their advantage. So uh, if you'll investigate the record, I think you'll see that that's creationist propaganda, that transitional forms don't exist in the fossil record, because they certainly do. I don't know if we can cover this in one minute. If we get slide carousel number two, slide number 17, uh, Australopithecines, what he's referring to is Lucy, uh, is the most complete fossil found. Lucy is the most complete, 40%, found by Donald Johansson, 1974, in the Ahura Gorge in Africa. <coughs> Donald Johansson uh, found claims he found this missing link, Australopithecine. Lucy was three feet tall. It was obviously a chimpanzee. Did it jam up on you? Okay, hold it right there. Forget it then. I'll just tell you about it. Um, Donald Johansson's Lucy was three feet tall. His argument was that Lucy walked upright because the femur bones, I'll just leave, I'll get it during, okay. The femur bone was angled, angled out. From the knee joint, it angles out to the hip like a human femur does. I've seen uh, many detailed pictures of Lucy. Um, what, what Donald Johansson does not say in his book, and I have his book, Lucy, the Beginnings of Humankind and Blueprints, Mysteries of Evolution, Donald Johansson does not say that any tree climbing monkey has an angled femur. Every monkey that climbs trees has an angled femur. He purposely used a, a ground dwelling monkey like a chimpanzee, which has a straight femur, as his argument that Lucy was becoming human. He does not say in the book that he found the leg bones for Lucy a mile and a half away from the head bones. The leg bones were 200 feet deeper in a different layer of strata. I would like to know how fast the train was going that hit that chimpanzee. <laughs> uh, his, his missing link argument, he is misinformed. I challenge you to read the quote book on the back table out there, the revised quote book. Ask any intelligent evolutionist if they really have any missing links. They'll say, no, sorry, we're still looking for them. See, the whole chain is missing.
Dr. Hoven, a question directed to you is, an anteater eats 250,000 ants each day. We are getting around to the flood here, and I had to go through these and try and find a lot of questions related just to the flood here. An anteater eats 250,000 ants each day. On the day that the animals left the ark, what did the anteater eat? Well, again, you're going back to the assumption that uh, all the animals as they are today is the way they, are, they were before the flood. And the Bible teaches a very different story. Since this is about the scriptural account, the scripture says all the animals were vegetarian before the flood. That's what it says, Genesis 1, 29 and 30. After the flood, with the climate changes and the decrease in air pressure, uh, and the release of the canopy being gone, I would say the animals gradually got a diversity in their diet. People today can live fine on vegetables or meat, or you can have pure meat or pure vegetables, uh, omnivores. So I, I wasn't there. I'm not going to prove what they ate. I know ants multiply awfully rapidly. And um, I would say within a short, dis short time, you'd have plenty, especially if there's only two or three or four anteaters to begin with. As far as the creator, he mentioned the clean kinds. I don't know, maybe we shouldn't give a rebuttal here, but... The kinds is in Leviticus, clean and unclean animals in Leviticus. We're talking about Genesis. This is way before Leviticus. How does he know the giraffes were clean? Clean hadn't been given till after the flood, long after the flood. So uh, the ants, uh, as far as what did they eat, the diets, I would say, would gradually change with the new environment they had to live in. Well, one thing that I'm learning is that there is a... Uh, a lot of difference in opinion among the creationists because the creationists will take a situation as it exists today. I believe the Pernuba moth and the Yuma plant is one of their favorite illustrations. The two are dependent upon each other in a way that I uh, don't have time to explain. And the creationists will argue, aha, you see, if they had not been created instantaneously, then neither one of them would be here today because the, uh, the moth couldn't have waited for the Yuma plant to evolve and the Yuma plant couldn't have waited for the moth to uh, evolve. You see, they want to play both sides of it. When there is an issue like that that seems to dispute their side of it about anteaters having to have 250,000 ants today, they say, oh, well, we don't know that that's what they ate back then. All right. We're going to go to roughly uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of a quarter to nine here, but this next question is to Mr. Till. Uh, I'm going to combine two questions here as these are very similar. Wouldn't the pitch or the tarry substance used by Noah keep out the water and thereby prevent the problem of warpage, etc., as you described. And to combine that with, uh, what about the width of the boat affecting its ability to keep from warping under pressure? Well, whoever wrote that uh, has a bigger problem than I have if you think that poses one for me. Pitch is a petroleum product. And uh, according to the creationists, that didn't develop until we had the catastrophe of the flood that buried all the forest under intense pressure. And, uh, and then, over a process of time, oil reserves and coal and all of that developed and pitch would be one of them. So it seems to me that when God told Noah to cover the ark with pitch inside and out, that Noah had a big problem because when he went to uh, the store to get his pitch, he found that there wasn't any, that it didn't exist back then according to the creationist argument. So uh, that's a problem for you, that's not a problem for me. And I'm going to be honest with you, I do not know whether shipbuilders in the last century uh, tried to use pitch or not, but I suppose that with technology having developed to the extent that it had at that time, that they would certainly be aware that this was a possibility or perhaps they had even a better product than pitch that they tried to use as a sealant. And still they couldn't prevent the warping according to all of the research that I'd done. Well, of course, his, his assumption is that the pitch had to be from an oil product that was formed after the flood. Oil can be made from a number of things. I mean, corn oil, 
safflower oil, sunflower seed oil, you can get oil from a number of vegetable sources. So the idea that it had to be an animal derivative. Of course, the Bible doesn't mention about the fish. They weren't, of course, not on the ark. And uh, as far as Noah, that's what fish is frequently used to make oil. Scientists in, a, in the laboratory several years ago took a ton of vegetable material and under pressure converted it to a barrel of oil, crude oil, in 20 minutes. I've got documentation on that in my suitcase, wherever it is uh, in the car right now, but uh, that, that has been done. Uh, I don't know where Noah got the pitch. He certainly could have made it himself out of either vegetable or animal derivative, either one. Okay. Thank you. This next question is directed to Dr. Hoven. Someone has asked, the amount of heat released by 40 days and 40 nights of vapor condensing to rain is enough to have raised the Earth's temperature to 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Scientifically, why did this not occur? Well, that's based on, of course, a couple of assumptions. I'd like to know where they got that number. It's going to raise the Earth's temperature to 6,000 degrees. Uh, the theory that I presented in my opening remarks was the idea of an ice meteor causing this phenomenon to happen, which uh, many features of the universe would indicate that there have been giant meteors, even some here on the Earth. I've been to Behringer Crater, big enough to have 20 football games that's simultaneously at the same time in the bottom. Some big rocks have hit this Earth in the past. There's a 47-mile crater in Canada, 47 mile in diameter. So uh, read the question one more time. I'm going to get off track here. Uh, yes. The the amount of heat released oh, by heat, 40 okay. days and 40 nights of vapor condensing to rain. Uh, the scenario that I presented of an ice meteor triggering the collapse of the canopy would counteract that with no problem. I couldn't prove it happened that way, and you couldn't prove it didn't happen that way. It's outside. It's, it's untouchable as far as science goes. Many things are. You know, it's just uh, a faith, just like evolution is untouchable. They, you know, make life in the laboratory. Make some today. If it happened in the past, do it today. That's not observable. That's not science. And yet we're all paying for that to be taught to the kids in the public school. That's not right either. <laughs> okay. I have to quick make a quick comment on the pitch. Strong and uh, various Hebrew scholars say that that word in Hebrew translated pitch meant bitumen. And bitumen is a petroleum product. Where did, uh, I have no idea who wrote this question, but I'm delighted to know that there's someone in the audience who has been thinking about this. Where did that person get the figure? Well, I don't know where the person got the figure, but I have an article with me, Physical Constraints on the Noachian Deluge. It was published in the Journal of Geological Education in 1983. I have it with me, and you can look at it, and it discusses in detail how that when water vapor condenses into rain, it releases energy. It tells you how much energy would have been released by the condensation of one kilogram of water. And it proceeds from there to show how that the temperature of the earth during a rain like that, which is described in the Bible, would have reached 3,500 degrees centigrade, 6,400 degrees Fahrenheit. At that time, the earth would have been the second hottest object in our solar system. Now that's scientific. All right, the next question is directed to Mr. Till. Scientists have now found plant life growing at the Mount St. Helens site where volcanic ash sits since 10 years ago. Have you a comment on this since you alluded to the great extent of time required for plant life to develop on volcanic ash? Now, I believe if whoever said that will check the facts, they'll see that plant life is growing where there was the mudslide, but where there is a strict bed of lava, that it takes about 200 years for it to decay into a, uh, a, a soil that plants can grow in. And uh, you know, you might find a plant growing here and there where maybe wind erosion has carried soil. But check that out and I think you'll see that that is the uh, standard finding in that matter. 
Well, that's an interesting one. Um, Surtsey erupted in Iceland, uh, off the coast of Iceland in 1963. <coughs> Today, it is an island covered with vegetation and hundreds of species of birds and animals, and it erupted out of the sea, pure lava, just 1963. So this business of it taking 200 years for lava to produce plant life is very inaccurate. And then, uh, maybe this is a previous question, I might, I've written it down here, I don't know if it is, but his figures of 6,000 degree Fahrenheit and all that kind of stuff is based on the assumption that it had to rain enough to go from today's sea level to cover Mount Everest. Well, if that much rain was released, then that's probably correct. But we have an awful lot less rain required for the flood if the mountains are lower and the oceans aren't as deep, plus the oceans or the water coming out of the earth producing some of the water, which would not have the evaporation, heat, uh, latent heat of condensation problem. So I don't buy that, pro I don't think it's a problem at all. And it's certainly not science, uh, as he said, you know, that we can prove it got up to 6,000 degrees for Noah's flood. Uh, I would disagree. So uh, plants and things like that producing, growing on lava, the carrots they grow in Alaska that are bigger than baseball bats grow in pure lava and volcanic soil. They do great. Uh, and it, can, it can happen very rapidly. Surtsey is a classic example to discredit what he just said. All right, thank you. This will be the last question directed to Dr. Holvin, and then it will be followed up by a question directed to Mr. Till. This question is directed to Dr. Holvin. This person has put uh, answer either or both, since it is the last question here, and they're both good. <coughs> if the cubit used at the time of the ark's building cannot be accurately determined now, why does the Genesis, De Genesis author avoid clearly establishing the unit of measurement? Why does the Genesis author avoid establishing? Well, a cubit is the distance from your elbow to your fingertip. Noah had it with him. Two of them. I mean, why did God need to establish it? God said, Noah, build it 600 or 300 cubits. Well, it's, it's obvious what the cubit was to Noah. There's no need to tell us. I mean, what else could you compare it with? We today use the foot or the yard, which originally were measurements from the fingertip to the nose or the length of a person's foot. Most of our English measurements come from body measurements initially, the inch, the width of the thumb, I believe it was, or the span. So I, I see no problem at all with the cubit being, Noah knew what it was. He was carrying it around. Okay. Uh, I'm going to surprise you, Dr. Holbein, and say I basically agree with what you say. Uh, I believe it was originally decided uh, that a foot was the length of a certain king's foot. Right. And uh, I don't remember exactly who that was, but uh, of course his foot would have been longer than someone else's or shorter than someone else's. And uh, so from here to here would vary from person to person. But scholars agree that it was about 18 inches. And uh, about the lava bed, I don't believe there is a forest growing on that volcanic island now, uh, is there, Dr. Holbein? And uh, we're talking about the, the volcanic soil decaying to the extent that a forest could take root and grow above the one that was below that uh, layer of volcanic overflow. And then the last question to Mr. Till. Can you prove scientifically that there was enough variation in the barometric pressure in the flood days to produce strong winds in order to damage the ark? Uh, no, I can't prove that, but I'm simply taking their scenario. Uh, when I say their scenario, <clears throat> I mean the scenario of the creation, creation scientists. And I just wish some of you people who are or, or amening practically everything that Dr. Hovine would is saying would take the time to study some of that literature. They described uh, volcanic eruptions everywhere, uh, winds and hurricanes of violent force. Uh, that is their scenario. And I'm simply suggesting to you that if they're going to use this to explain how perhaps uh, a layer of rock could be folded like he showed to us, instead of accepting the fact that maybe this was caused by the pressure of uh, continental drift, if he's going to accept that as an explanation for geological phenomena that we see today, then he's going to have to explain to us how the ark could have withstood forces unlike anything that any ship ever experienced before. 
And if he's going to be scientific about it, he's going to have to do more than say, well, they were smarter back then than we are now. Read the question one more time, if you would, please. Yes, sir. The question was, can you prove scientifically that there was enough variation in the barometric pressure in the flood days to produce strong winds to damage the ark? Right. Here you are with a case of proving a, proving a negative. It cannot be done. Can you prove it didn't happen that way? Uh, Mr. Till has not proven that the scriptural account is impossible scientifically, I don't believe. I think I gave a scenario that it could have happened. I think with the, uh, as far as the size of the ark, that seems to be his primary objection, that you cannot build a boat. We have boats an awful lot bigger than 400 feet today made out of steel. If Noah had the technology and the wisdom that we would attribute to a person 600 years old with the ability to talk to his great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, and everybody in between, I think they probably had unbelievable technology that we're not aware of. Some uh, unusual features are found. And so uh, a hammer was found with dinosaur bones and footprints in Glen Rose, Texas, a stainless steel type hammer that can only be built under double atmospheric pressure. So um, I think they had a lot of technology and they, um, we, we tend to get in the evolutionary mindset of we're advanced, they're dumb. The atheists have the very same mindset. Atheism is good. We are smart. Fundamental Bible believers are dumb. That is really what they believe, and it's been portrayed numerous times here tonight. <laughs> that's the attitude, and I think, that's, I think that needs to be rethought, Mr. Till. Uh, everybody may not be quite as dumb as you give us credit for. Thank you. Gentlemen, we didn't discuss this. Would you like, a, like two minutes to have closing remarks? Uh, it's up to you, gentlemen. Sure. You have some closing remarks? Like we, two minutes. Sure, we left a lot of things hanging. That'd be good. Left a lot of things hanging? Okay. I don't want to hang anyone tonight. So we're going to begin with uh, Dr. Hovind, because uh, the last question was directed here to Mr. Till. So Dr. Hovind, if you'd like to take, uh, let's go two minutes, if we could, two minutes. Okay, great. Uh, I've got several pages of things we've really left hanging. He mentioned that uh, water weighs eight pounds per gallon. What held it up there? I'd like to inform him that clouds are pure water. And they obviously are up there. Um, I don't know. I know that real cold ice at 300 or 400 below zero, ice becomes magnetic. You can pick it up with a magnet. And the Earth's magnetic field is declining rapidly. NASA says the half-life of our magnetic field is now about 830 years. We're losing our magnetic strength pretty rapidly. So in Noah's day, the magnetic field may have been 20 to 30 times stronger than it is today. One plausible scenario is that the, it was an ice barrier, which would be water, like it mentions, only in the frozen form, suspended by the magnetic field. It certainly could have been a canopy, a vapor barrier. Venus and Jupiter are covered with uh, vapor barriers, canopies, have, and they, it's extremely hot on the surface of Venus for that reason. Many of the planets have these layers to the atmosphere. The Earth certainly could have had a, a canopy of water, the Bible says it did. Um, he mentioned the rotten luck syndrome. Why not go dig up the ark and show it to us? Talk about the rotten luck syndrome. Sh let's find some missing links. Show me, show me how life evolved. Make some in the laboratory for me today. They can't seem to do it today. They say, well, it had a pre-flood environment, you know, different. Uh, pre -pre the early environment was methane gas, they refer to, and, and uh, high CO2 levels and no oxygen and all that. Well, that was Miller's experiments, and all he did was produce a few amino acids, and then he had to trap them carefully so they didn't get destroyed going back to you again. Miller did not create life in the laboratory, made a few amino acids is all, and, but they, they have the same rotten luck syndrome. They can't prove evolution at any turn. They can't find any of the missing links between any of the major kinds of animals. What they do is point to little variations or extinct lines, and as if extinction somehow proves the theory. Well, to me, that would be more evidence for creation. They'll say man lost his tail because we didn't need it. Didn't need it. Have you ever thought how handy it would be to have a tail? <laughs> Come to the door with two sacks of groceries and try to open the door with your tail to get in it. All the examples they give are examples of losses, not gains. Um, this missing link, uh, rotten luck syndrome is on their back, not mine. Thank you very much, Dr. Goldman. <laughs> Mr. Tell. Well, I'm not going to uh, speak about the missing links in the two minute that two minutes that I have because, uh, except that I'm going to say, it's a funny thing to me that a paleontologist like Stephen Jay Gould will spend his lifetime studying fossils, a microbiologist 
like uh, Stephen, uh, not Stephen, but uh, Richard Dawkins will spend his lifetime studying biology and by the thousands and thousands, they say evolution is the explanation for the diversity on Earth. A man like Dr. Holbein will spend his life reading the Bible, and he'll say creation is the explanation for life on Earth. Uh, I would like to take the time to address just how old the Earth is. He wants us to believe that it's about 6,000 years old. I would like for uh, you people to go to the April 19, 1993 issue of Natural History and read an article about the Kosgei Cave in southern France along the Mediterranean Sea in which Paleolithic art was discovered. Scientists have subjected that art to radiometric dating, which he will scoff at and ridicule because it conflicts with his theory. And they subjected charcoal that was found on the floor of the cave to use in, the, in making the outlines of the paintings. And six different tests by six different studios said that those paintings are as old as 27,800 years. That's a little bit too old for his creationist theory. My time is already up. Thank you, Dr. Holvin, and thank you, Mr. Till. I think most of our contestants deserve a round of applause. Yes. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this debate on the flood of Noah and the biblical account being historically and scientifically accurate. Much more important, though, than knowing all the details about science in the Bible is knowing for sure you're going to heaven. If you're not sure you're going to heaven, let me encourage you to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. God loves you. He died for you on the cross, and He wants to forgive you and save you. And all He's waiting on is an invitation from you to forgive your sins. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. February 9th, 1969, I bowed my head and I said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I deserve to go to hell, but I believe you died for me. And I'd like to ask you to forgive me. The Bible teaches that God will take the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross and apply it to your account. So it looks to God like you are perfect because your sins have been totally cleansed by the blood of Christ. It's a wonderful thing to know for sure you're going to heaven. If you would just pray and say, Lord, would you forgive me and save me? He would do it. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then today would be your spiritual birthday into God's family. The Bible says you must be born again to go to heaven. So this would be your birthday. The day you receive Christ is the day you become a child of God. John chapter 1 and verse number 12 talks about that. You just have to receive Christ and you become God's child by getting born into His family. So I'd like to encourage you to do that. If you do, please write and let us know. Or if we could be uh, any help, answer any questions, or help you to grow closer to the Lord, please don't hesitate to contact us. If you haven't seen any of our other videotapes, I'd encourage you to get some of those. We have videos on all sorts of topics on creation and evolution and dinosaurs, as well as topics like the Y2K problem, the Bible and health, and a variety of uh, subjects like that. Just call or write, we'll send you a free catalog. Thanks so much.